you all know that facing people with irrational belief systems just ain't easy in fact. There are some people you can talk to, and it doesn't matter what you say to them. They're just not going to listen. You can tell them, I'm sorry, the movie is not made of cheese, and they're still going to believe it. But we have with us tonight someone who is skilled in the art of making sure that people with irrational belief systems finally get some sense knocked into their heads, especially those people in the media. He is the author of many books, most famously the Gun Facts series. He's been doing this for many years. Please give a very warm welcome uh, to a, a stalwart, a hero of the Second Amendment community, Mr. Guy Smith. Thank you, sir. You're, you're too generous. When all these people up here said there was a wonderful speaker tonight, my, my wife turned to me and said, I can't wait to learn who it is. <laughs> well, thanks for having me back again. I've been here before. Um, I gave um, Mark a list of things I could possibly talk about, and he picked two. And then I said, we're just going to smash those together. And what we're going to talk about is the new number one anti-gun talking points and what I have discovered, some astounding facts that give really great perspective about the con job that the gun control industry is currently doing. And uh, you'll forgive me for bringing PowerPoint slides, but uh, as they say, power corrupts absolutely. PowerPoint corrupts everything absolutely. <laughs> so for those of you who have not had the misfortune of meeting me before, I've been doing the Gun Facts Project for about 15 years. Very humble beginnings. It was basically an elaborate crib sheet. And what the whole purpose is, is to make sure that we are debunking the lies told by the gun control industry. And as that, the copyright on my material is, um, to use a bad word, liberal. Um, you are allowed basically to plagiarize my work at will when you're talking to somebody, when you're writing letters to the editor, when you're posting things in social media. That includes all the graphics, all the text, and I actively encourage you to do so. Last year, we made a major shift. We turned it into a modern website, a responsive website. If you have a smartphone, pull out your phone right now, bookmark gunfacts.info. So if you're at a town hall meeting and you hear a politician lying through his teeth, bring this up, find the search engine, key in the search word. We will feed you not only all the facts to refute the politician, but we've got, I think it's now up to 600 detailed footnotes, all from credible independent sources in there. You cannot be shot down with this information. And this platform that we moved to last year is going to be a lot of fun. It lets us do interesting things in the future, such as translating all of this information to other languages and getting a lot more people working on the data than just me. And to foreshadow something next year, we're actually going to be asking for sponsorships um, so that I can spend more time working on this than I already do. So let's talk about fear and loathing. Um, something interesting has happened. The anti-gun crowd has lost. They lost the constitutional argument. They lost the criminological argument. They lost the public opinion argument. So that doesn't leave them a lot to work with, and they are resorting more now than ever before to fear tactics. And why is fear the main tool in politics? Because it bypasses logic. It, it gets to your instinctive gut reactions that your ancestors spent millions of years creating. So they scare the heck out of people just to get them to favor gun control. And it's always their intention and they will continue doing it. So your first mission is to remove fear by giving people who are not familiar with guns perspective. Give them an idea of what the reality really is. One of the interesting things in politics at the moment is that for the last three decades, violence in this country has been plummeting. Gun violence has been plummeting. The American public doesn't unknown this. They don't believe it. They think we're a more violent society now than we were in the early 1990s. Our job is to remove that fear. One of the things that I'm kind of proud of is that I am the oddball who thought of the fun shoot at the Alameda NRA Members Council. 
This has been the most fundamental tool for removing fear from the public in places like Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco. It's open to the public. People are allowed to come and shoot guns almost for free. They pay a small entry fee. They get a mandatory safety instruction from an NRA member, which immediately takes away the fear of the NRA and a bit of fear from the guns. Then they get taken out to the shooting range, and they are supervised by an NRA member in every lane. And I'll make this short observation. NRA members are, of course, safe, but I want to put these guys on a diet. Everyone down this row <laughs> is about 40 pounds above their prime weight. Um, so from left to right, down the 17 lanes of the San Leandro gun range, they have everything. They start you off on 22 calibers on the left-hand side to BFGs all the way down on the other end. And you get to come up and shoot whatever firearm you want and keep walking down the range until you go, okay, that's about as aggressive as I want to get. This has gotten so popular that the line extends out the range, into the parking lot, almost all the way to the street. They have to divide it up into three programs. They own the gun range for an entire Sunday. And it's gotten so popular that even a reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle came over and wrote, and I'm paraphrasing, if Diane Feinstein really wants to be scared of something, they should be scared of the NRA Members Council in Alameda because they're converting hundreds of people a day who come and shoot and say, oh, this is not bad. Just like our friend who was up here earlier today. You take somebody out to shoot, the fear goes away, and they find the fun. So let's talk about some of the bunkum that the other side... Ooh. Is that redundant? I cannot help but laugh out loud when I see him. So gun violence is a national epidemic. That's one of the recurring themes of the gun control industry. And this is what America doesn't currently realize. This is violent crime and firearm homicides over the last three decades, from the time that violent crime peaked in 1993. This is an amazing turn of events. We are now at violence levels that we did not see since the beginning of the 1960s. If we could clean up inner city gang violence, we would be down to Eisenhower era low levels of violence. We can do that. California's violent crime is even a better story. You notice that in 1993, firearm homicides in this state were 40% 40 40 above the national average. And they've come down to the national average. Now we'll talk about it in a second. The anti-gun crowd has caught on to this. And they have spun a wonderful con job out of it. And I hate to say it, I have to applaud them for their brilliance. Speaking of which, this is the group, the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence up in San Francisco. Don Kilmer's not here, right? Good, I can use the word shyster then. This is a, this is a cobble of shysters up in San Francisco with the mission of creating new gun control laws, creating the propaganda to support those gun control laws, and getting them passed. And so they created this pamphlet, 20 years of putting safety first. What in the hell do they know about safety? Oh, they're ambulance chasers, right. They have. <laughs> so they say that the history of success in enacting smart gun laws in California shows how these laws have contributed to a significant gun a uh, significant drop in gun death rates. Raise your hand if you see the con first con job. What? Smart? Well, that's a good one, but... Success. Success? It was dropping anyway. The national was dropping. The con job is gun death rates. That's the first con job. Let's go back to this slide. Firearm homicide rates. You notice that California doesn't drop down to national levels until almost 2012. But according to their chart, down in the lower right-hand corner, California dropped below national levels somewhere around the year 2000. That's a big difference. So how did this difference come about? Well, we know about the firearm homicide rate. Yep, I screwed myself up. One of the reasons is because of suicides. Something happened, I have not had the leisure to study this, 
that suicides in the state of California dropped faster than the national average during the 1990s, fell at an incredible rate. So you take suicides out of the equation, you look at just firearm homicides, we get back to the truth. So they say it's their gun control laws that were responsible for the drop in crime. But what really happened? Roberti Roos passed in 1990, that was before violence rates started to fall. Private transfer of registrations was 1991, that was two years before the fall. And we know that criminals tend to buy off the street instead of the retail store, so that didn't, or a gun show, so that didn't matter. Uh, having to pass a written test to get your handgun, that didn't happen until 1994, that was after the violence rates started to fall. And then you got to go all the way out to 1997 when all they did was increase the waiting period for a new handgun. So they cannot actually explain how their laws created this difference because the timing is all wrong. So why did violence in California peak in the year 1993? The one thing they don't want to talk about, 1993 was the year that the citizens of California passed the three strikes law with a gun enhancement called 1020 Life. Use a gun in a crime, you're going to prison for 10 years. You don't have a choice. Judge doesn't have a choice. You fire that gun in the commission of a crime, you're going to jail for 20 years. You actually hit somebody with a bullet, and you're never coming out of jail. In the first decade of the three strikes law, over 80,000 people were processed. 17,000 alone from L.A. County, which is the original gangster paradise. So if you take a thug, and we know that most violent crime is committed by repeat violent offenders, you take them off the street for 10 years, that's 10 years of violent crime that goes away. That is what is responsible for California's success. Not a single gun control law was even involved. Why is this point critical? You may have heard about this document. It got leaked a couple of years ago. It was created by some K Street lobbyists in Washington, D.C., who did some research to find out what people do and don't believe about guns and gun control. And they wrote this for the gun control industry. It's their internal handbook to say, this is how you should communicate to Americans. And one of the things that they found out was men and women both were very motivated by the idea of crime control. And they said, quite bluntly in this book, don't talk about crime control, because that plays into the pro-gun argument. Never talk about that. Just talk about gun violence. So if you get out there and you say that we passed a three strikes law and it caused our violence rate to drop down to national levels, and these same laws were passed in other states around the country, and the whole country's violence rate fell dramatically, then you win the argument right away because you have appealed to both men and women and their need and their desire to be safe from the criminal element. So con job number two, America has the most gun crime in the world. How many people believe that? Show of hands. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to run my finger down this chart. You, you yell stop when you think I'm pointing at the United States. Stop right there. No. Back, back, back. back. Right there. <laughs> That's a little too low. How about anyone else? Stop. Right there? No. No. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Here's what the real stat is. Worldwide, on average, five people out of every 100,000 is murdered with a gun. United States is the bar all the way on the left of the graph. Our firearm homicide rate is a little less than three people for every 100,000. So in other words, the United States gun homicide rate is almost half of the worldwide average. Now can somebody tell me what's really odd about this graph? There's something that should be just jumping out at people. Well, those five countries don't allow private citizens to have guns. That's one. What looks peculiar about this graph? There's something really odd. There are a lot of countries that are reporting zero crime. 
Now, you notice the United States, we've got all the guns and almost none of the gun homicides. Other countries got all the gun homicides and none of the guns. One of the interesting things about this chart is that the worst of the worst nations on the planet don't report their crime statistics, much less break out what their firearm homicide rate is. <laughs> Syria, Rwanda, Somalia, we don't know what their firearm homicide rate is. In fact, we don't know what the firearm homicide rate of the countries where only the government owns the guns is. There's not a really good model for predicting this, but I did kind of a hip shoot in a spreadsheet one day. I believe that if we could model this, the actual worldwide firearm homicide rate would be above six people per every 100,000, more than double what the United States is. So America doesn't have a gun problem compared to the rest of the world. So when I tell this to somebody in the anti-gun groups, they immediately change the debate. Imagine that. They say, okay, well, America has the highest gun violence of industrialized countries or wealthy countries. I got to give them this one. They actually got that one right. The United States is on the right-hand side, and the blue bars are the number of firearm homicides per 100,000. But that doesn't tell the whole story. Because if you look at just gun homicides, you don't understand actually how many people are being murdered in general. This is just the homicide rate, guns or any other means of killing somebody. And you'll see that the United States is still high, but we're not number one. And we see a lot of countries that have a reputation for being peaceful and they're anything but. But we also know that guns have defensive purposes as well as offensive purposes, so we should look at other crimes. This is the rate of robberies in industrialized countries. United States, all the way out there on the right, almost invisible. You go over to Belgium, you'll get mugged on every street corner. We've known that for a fact for a long time that in the UK, they have one of the highest rates of hot home invasion robberies in the planet. If you don't know what a hot home invasion is, it's where a bunch of thugs break into your house while you are there, beat you up, tie you up, take your stuff, and usually kill you on the way out so that you won't tell the cops. That almost never happens in the United States. Why? Criminologists have told us this for years. Criminologists have this wonderful habit. They break into prison. They go into prison and they mentally molest all the convicts there, and they ask them interesting questions about their criminal past. They ask, how did you get into crime? What is your favorite type of crime? Does being incarcerated affect your chance of re-election? They... <laughs> well, that's in Chicago. Um, but one of the questions that they've asked routinely is, what is your opinion about an armed citizen? And what they say is that if I have a doubt about my victim being armed, I leave them alone. Not if I know that I'm armed, if I have a doubt. This is the uncertainty principle at work. Criminals, we like to think they're stupid, but they at least do the risk-benefit analysis. And the risk of death is very high. The benefit of 20 bucks out of your wallet is very low. They're going to leave you alone if they think you might be armed. So this gets to, I think, one of the more interesting perspectives I ever ran across. When I first got the homicide rates for this country, I plotted it on this graph, and I said, that is a very weird looking trend line. What is going on here? This makes no sense to me. So I asked myself what was happening historically, because incidentally, at the same time, I also got the homicide stats for England and Wales, and their homicide rate stays right at around two or a little bit lower year after year. It doesn't fluctuate a lot. So these things made me curious. Why this curve? Well, first was prohibition. Back in the early 20th century, we made illegal a recreational, recreational narcotic, and as a side effect, we generated gangs, 
who used violence in order to obtain and to protect profitable territory. The moment that we repealed prohibition, the violence rate started to drop instantly. Went down and stayed low during the Depression years, the war years, the Eisenhower years, right up through the 60s until almost the end of the 1960s, and then started to go up again. I believe it's because we outlawed some recreational narcotics, and as a side effect, generated a bunch of gangs who used violence in order to take and hold profitable territory. I won't opine on whether drugs are good or bad. I don't take them myself, unless you count Jack Daniels as a drug. <laughs> but um, this is part of the explanation. But then it gets even more curious, because the violence rate goes down, even though we have not repealed the war on drugs. Why is this? One of the curious things about this period was the national reaction to violent crime spiraling out of control. It was different in every state. Some people passed three-strike laws, some people passed mandatory sentencing of other types. But starting in 1988 in my home state of Florida, we had the first major state switch over to shall issue concealed carry. And after a couple of years of other states waiting and watching to see how this experiment was going to work out, other states started flipping as well. And we've gone from 10 to 42 shall issue states over this period where violent crime is dropping through the floor. Could it be the uncertainty principle at play? Could it be that the thugs are a little bit worried about who they're mugging at the ATM? Very good probability. But here's what I have found most interesting. The golden age of gun control started basically in 1969. Bobby Kennedy assassinated, Martin Luther King assassinated. America, according to Gallup poll trending over a long period of time, kind of fell in love with the idea of gun control. Washington, D.C. banned handguns. Chicago banned handguns. Massive gun control ordinances at every level of government. And we tried that experiment for a long time, right up until about the 1990s. And violent crime continued to explode. Now, I'm not brave enough to say that gun control caused violent crime, but it sure as hell did not make the situation better. And this is something that needs to be communicated to people. We tried the experiment. The experiment failed. Fast forward to what I call the same age of gun rights liberation. 10 to 42 states went concealed carry. We backed out assault weapons ban. We quit making it a felony to lend guns to somebody overnight in certain states. And the rate of violence plummeted. I'm not brave enough to say that gun rights liberation caused a drop in violent crime, but it did not make the situation worse. So when you talk to somebody who's anti-gun, you say, we tried gun control, it failed. We tried gun liberalization. It did not make the situation worse. And for whatever reason, the situation has gotten better. If you respect your neighbor, if you love your neighbor, if you want your neighbor to be safe, you have to defend his right to figure out how to defend himself. So con job 2.1, America has the highest gun homicide rate of industrialized countries, true, but we have lower violence rates in other categories. We have a huge gun, or I'm sorry, a huge gang and drug violence industry in our inner cities. And it is those inner cities that are the heart of whatever problem we have here in America. We will note that guns are not used to murder everywhere. So what's the difference between Chicago, Illinois, and Crossville, Tennessee? Chicago has a homicide rate of 18.5. What is that, uh, almost four times the national average? Crossville, Tennessee, a place where if you don't own a gun, they think you're kind of peculiar, <laughs> has a homicide rate of zero. So guns evidently are not the determinant variable. So guns are not an American problem. They're a highly localized problem. Here's California's homicide rate by county. Does not look evenly distributed to me. 
Top offenders, Los Angeles County. Yay, not us. Next, Alameda County, because of Oakland. I used to live in the city of Alameda. If you've never been there, it's a little island in San Francisco Bay. There's only two ways out of Alameda. You either jump in the bay and swim for it, or you drive through Oakland. That's the worst part of living in Alameda. My wife spent most of her life there. When we met, she had to move into my house. I think it was the only house in Alameda she hadn't previously lived in before. <laughs> After that, San Francisco County. You ever been to the Mission District or Hunter's Bay Point? Nice places. So why aren't murders going down in all the rest of California? Because it's an inner city problem. It's gang related. It's in places where subcultures believe that killing people is a fun, noble, or life affirming act. So guns are not an American problem. American homicide rate is 4.7 people for every 100,000. That's total homicides, not just firearm homicides. The top 20 cities, the top 20 most deadly cities in America have only 7% of the country's population, but they have 21% of the nation's homicide. Let me repeat that. 20 freaking cities have one-fifth of America's homicides. So if you know somebody who's anti-gun, whip this little stat out of them and say, all you have to do to be safe is to avoid Detroit, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Memphis, Chicago, blah, 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 including Jacksonville, Florida, where all of my family comes from. That was kind of disappointing to hear. If we make these 20 cities just vanish, like ship them off to Syria or something, the national homicide rate would fall 15%. Think about that. 15% reduction in murders just by taking care of a disease in 20 cities. All right, this is the one I really want to focus on because the anti-gun crowd has latched onto this viciously. Women are at most risk from guns. If a rapist has a 38 snub nose shoved up his nostril, I think he will have a different opinion about women and guns. This all comes from one report, Homicide, Suicide, and Unintentional Firearm Fatalities comparing the United States with other high-income countries. This is the report that the anti-gun crowd has latched onto. I think you probably have already spotted the flaw that the report was based on firearms. They unintentionally reported other stuff, but what they wanted to try to prove that was if firearms were evil. And any time that you bias a report by trying to focus on one cause, it becomes an illegitimate report right away. So anyway, one of their conclusions was that 86% of all women killed by firearms around the planet, 86% of them were U.S. women. Statistically accurate, thoroughly misleading. One of the reasons is that women commit suicide. Not as often as men do, but they do. And in the United States, people who commit suicide, regardless of their gender, tend to use firearms more than other methods. Hence, total female gun deaths are high, but that's because the gun suicide rate among women is higher than the gun homicide rate among women. If you're a woman, you're more likely to kill yourself with a gun than to be killed by somebody else with a gun. What this actually means is that very few women, statistically speaking, are killed with guns because women commit suicide a lot less often than men. So, one organization, the Center for American Progress, and if there's ever been a bigger perversion of the word progress, I have not encountered it, they gathered this report and they made all sorts of frightening conclusions, among which are, of all the women killed by intimate partners, 55% were killed with a gun. I don't know about you, but if somebody killed me, I'm not real picky about how they did it. I'm kind of picky about the fact that they did do it. So what does this mean? This got me curious. What's the probability of a woman being murdered, period, in industrialized countries? It just so happens that out of all the wealthy countries, as defined by the OED, the Organization for Economic Development, 
The United States is next to last in terms of women being likely to be killed as compared to men. There was only one country that scored less than us. That was Luxembourg. 100% of their murders were of men. Which means they probably had one murder that year. And they happened to be a dude. <laughs> At the opposite end is Iceland, where everybody murdered that year was a woman. Probably the same thing. And she was probably killed with an icicle. Um, <laughs> if you're a Japanese woman, you're 140% more likely to be murdered than a man than you are if you're here in the United States. If you're in New Zealand, 133% more likely than a man than in the United States. In other words, if you're a woman, one of the safest places you can be in the developed world is the United States. <laughs> so next time somebody says women are at risk from guns, tell them, yeah, in other places, but not here. And that's the funny thing. In Japan, you cannot own a gun for love nor money. And um, but, yeah. let's hope this doesn't sound too racist, but Japanese women are kind of tiny. Anyone can beat them up. I know some Boy Scouts who could beat up a Japanese adult woman. So a Japanese woman going up against, you know, any male thug is going to lose, period. So the con job is that women in the United States are 11 times more likely to be murdered with a gun than in other high-income countries. This is where it gets kind of interesting. Women, their total homicide rate in this country is 2.6 for every 100,000. Men, it's 9.6. If there's anyone at danger for guns in this country, it's men. But that's where the story gets sticky because gang violence is a very, very male project. Men killing men in the inner cities over gang turf is the number one cause of firearm death in this country. So let's sum this up. The gun death rate in women included suicides. Suicide by gun in America is kind of popular. Women are less likely to be murdered than in, in the U.S. than in all other industrialized countries. Gun availability is likely a factor in both. Though U.S. women are not prone to suicide, those who do commit suicide choose a gun. But women with guns scare the bleep out of their attackers, and thus they get killed less often. They are less likely to be attacked, and if attacked, they are more likely to survive than women in other countries who do not have access to firearms. So let's talk about suicides for a second, because the anti-gun crowd keeps throwing suicides into the mix of what they call gun deaths. And it's horrible that I'm so excited about talking about suicides. So you probably recognize these two joints, the United States and Canada. Interesting comparison, because culturally, we're very similar. We have the same heritage. We have the same entertainment packages. We have the same oddball habits. We even enjoy the same crazy sports. In fact, I've only identified two real differences between our countries. One is that Canadians are inordinately polite. The other is that here in America, we like real beer. <laughs> if a Canadian ever offers you a beer, say, no thank you. My horse just took a piss that has flavor. <laughs> so you would think that with amazingly similar cultures, there would be almost identical suicide rates because the same attitudes, the same social values, the same religious uh, preferences, and you would be right. Canada, 10.4 people for every 100,000 kill themselves. America, 10.1. And if you have ever spent a winter out here in the Western Territories, I'm really surprised the suicide rate isn't much higher. If I had to spend a winter out there, I would shoot myself just to see a color other than white. <laughs> so, almost identical suicide rates. But, Canada has about one-third the number of guns. So the availability of a gun cannot be a determinant variable. One third of the number of guns, exactly the same suicide rate. So you probably recognize these two joints. 
And if you didn't recognize Lithuania, I can't blame you because I didn't recognize it when I looked up the map either. Lithuania has the highest suicide rate in the world, or at least in, in all industrialized countries. Nearly four times higher than the United States. So obviously they have four times as many guns as we do. Actually, Lithuania has less than 1% of the firearms per capita than the United States, and has four times the suicide rate. By the way, for people with morbid curiosity, in Canada, suicidal people prefer to take poison. In Lithuania, they prefer to hang themselves. I think close to 82% of Lithuanians who commit suicide hang themselves. So we need rope control. <laughs> so do guns lead to suicides? Of course not. The presence of a gun doesn't cause somebody to want to commit suicide. Being chronically depressed for a long period of time causes people to want to commit suicide. In fact, when you look at the suicide rate compared to the number of households that have a gun, I chose number of households because you don't necessarily have to own a gun to commit suicide with one. You just have to be able to get your hands on it. You'll see zero correlation between the two. The Netherlands has a suicide rate just a little bit lower than the United States. Comparatively speaking, they have no guns at all. And if you look at it time-wise in the United States, that little blue line across the top is our suicide rate. And that green line that seems to be going up into the stratosphere is the number of handguns in circulation in the United States. If guns led to suicides, that many more handguns would have caused a lot more people to kill themselves. So it's not a variable. So guns lead to homicides. Well, they didn't lead to suicide, so how in the heck do they lead to homicides? So a show of hands, how many people own a gun? <laughs> Leave your hand up if you have murdered somebody with that gun. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't count. <laughs> One of the things that the anti-gun crowd likes to do is called causal effect. They like to see two numbers that move in the same direction. They say, ah, they're obviously related. I can prove, statistically, that air conditioning causes rape. <laughs> because when the rate of use of air conditioning goes up, the rate of rape goes up. So obviously, air conditioning causes rape. No, what happens is that people are outdoors, people are wearing less clothing, people who are prone to rape have more opportunities. That's why it happens. But the anti-gun crowd looks for causal relationship and uses it to scare the heck out of people. One of the things that I'm sensitive to, having grown up in the South, is a lot of the bunkum that people throw around about race, poverty, and guns. Because I have seen a lot of the South where a lot of people are poor, a lot of people are black, and they are not killing each other. They may be rural, they may be very religious, God-fearing people, but they're not homicidal at all. So I wanted to give a little perspective to this, and I wanted to compare two cities. I spent the first six years of my life in Atlanta, Georgia. And then I spent ten years parked right next door to Oakland, California. It ended up being a good comparison. They had almost identical populations. So it's a good contrast between the two. Happens that Atlanta has a lot more black people than Oakland. 92% higher concentration of blacks. Their poverty rate is actually higher, almost 20% higher. So in theory, if being black, if being poor, if being uh, underemployed are variables in making somebody want to kill somebody, then Atlanta should really have a bad violent crime rate and a high homicide rate, but the violent crime rate in Atlanta is 31% less, and the homicide rate is a full 40% less. So when you hear people talking about crime statistics and they say, oh, it's an inner city problem, it's a race problem, blah, 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 or it's a race problem, it's not. It's a subculture problem, which may be associated with a race or two, but you take people of that same race and you put them in a different environment, they 
are not infected by the gang culture. They are not infected by a desire to kill people to prove their manhood or whatever bunkum reason that gangs have for doing drive-by shootings. So con job number five is that they never talk about gang violence. Gangs are pivotal in terms of violence in this country. If you think about being a gang member, part of your job description is to break the law. That's the whole purpose of being in a gang, really. And I've only started my research on this, but I have a theory. I have a theory that all homicides and all gun homicides have a mental health issue. We know that if you commit suicide, you've got a depression issue, a mental health issue. Mother Jones, when they did their research on mass public shootings, they concluded that nearly 66% of all mass public shooters had a history of mental health problems. My theory is that gang members, as a class of people, have a mental health problem. I've only uncovered one research report so far, but it concluded that 100% of the members of one gang down in LA were sociopaths. 100% of their members could not give a damn about you or any other human being. I forget the number, but a very large percent of them were outright psychopaths. It's not that they didn't mind killing somebody, they actually liked it. It was their form of recreation. So it's a big city problem. Criminals devolved to poverty. High population density areas, the big cities with poor neighborhoods are the natural landing place for violent criminals. And thus it becomes a big city problem. Here are those top 20 homicide cities scattered around the country. You can see that most of the country is completely unaffected by firearm homicides. So it's a big city mayor problem, and this is who I'm going to blame. Big city mayors only care about poor people at election. Poor people cannot do a politician a single favor except vote for them. And the moment that the election is over, the politician has absolutely no motivation to try to help people not die in the inner cities. And as we saw before, if they did, if they put a little money, if they put a little effort in it, they could drop the homicide rate in this country by 15%. But do you think Rahm Emanuel is going to listen to that? Do you think the mayor of Los Angeles is going to listen to that? Mayor of Washington, D.C. certainly isn't going to listen to that. And then I suppose this last one in because I'm just so happy about this one. <laughs> Every year, the Brady campaign comes out with their scorecard of states, ranking the states by the strength of their gun control laws. And every year, I pop this into a scatter diagram and spend hours trying to find some sort of covariance between what Brady thinks is strong gun control and violence. This diagram shows that there is no correlation between what Brady thinks is a good gun control law and violent crime. But this year I noticed something I had never noticed before. Let me explain the graph just real quick. This top line is their score. The number one state is right there, the one with supposedly the strongest gun control laws. All the way over there is number 50, the one who's dead last, the one that Brady thinks has just the worst gun control laws in the world. And this is how they rank in terms of violent crime. What I had never noticed before was number one and number 50. California and Arizona. What's interesting is that their violent crime rate is almost identical. The state with what supposedly has the best gun control and the state with worst gun control doesn't have a dime's worth of difference in terms of their violent crime rate. What does this mean? It means that Brady has absolutely no idea that gun control has no bearing on violent crime. But they don't need to believe that, because that's not their end game. They don't want safe neighborhoods. They don't want safe inner cities. They want your guns. So here's your call to action. First, your primary job is to fight the fear. Fear is the tool of the politicians. If you can eliminate fear, you cause people to disbelieve what the fear mongers say. 
The moment you take somebody to a range, you teach them how to shoot, you show them that your average NRA member is not a raving lunatic, et cetera, et cetera, the fear goes away. And because they've lost on every other front, the gun control industry is going to use fear even more. When Florida passed their standard ground law, this was an honest-to-God Brady campaign poster flyer that they were handing out at airports to try to scare people getting off of the plane, making them think that Mickey Mouse was going to gun them down in the middle of the Magic Kingdom. Okay, goofy. I'll give you that. I don't know. Snow White with an AR-15 has kind of a sexy edge. Like our friend here said, go take somebody to shoot. You cannot be scared of something that you have experienced. That NRA fun shoot that I mentioned, the second one we ever had, I invited a bunch of people to. I was a member of a meetup group, a bunch of film buffs, people who like to go out and see interesting foreign films and stuff. Um, 73% of them lived in Berkeley, the rest of them lived in San Francisco. So I tried an experiment. I just sent a message out to the group. I said, fun shoot this Sunday. Why don't you come and join me? I was not aware that people could be that hateful. <laughs> but five of them showed up. Five of them shot with us. And five of them got back online and said, you know, I met a bunch of people from the NRA and I kind of liked them. <laughs> they were polite. They taught me something. They let me shoot their ammo. I mean, you know, what's not to like about these people? Last but not least, counter every lie and every opportunity that you find it online, in person, arguing with your politician, writing letters to the editor. What has happened over time, and one of the reasons I've been doing gun facts for longer than I probably should have, is that... It's a slow process, but as you whittle away at the credibility of the gun control industry, more and more people disbelieve them. You may have seen a Gallup poll just came out with a survey two days ago that said over that 63% of Americans feel safer if they have a gun in the house. This is an all-time record, and one of the reasons is that over time, we chiseled away at their lies, and the gun control industry has lost credibility. Another Gallup survey indicated that the NRA was now considered a mainstream political organization. You can't say that about Michael Bloomberg's group or the Brady campaign or any other gun control group. And last but not least, keep fighting. Because the other side will never stop. I thought about getting out of gun facts. I had a telephone conversation with my friend Tom Gresham at Gun Talk Radio. And I said, I've got a choice. I can either get out of this or I can try to make you know, a living doing this. And he said, guy, keep going. This battle is never going to end. And he's right. I'm a big fan of H.L. Mencken's. I've read just about everything he ever wrote. And he wrote about in the 1920s about the do-gurders who were trying to ban guns. It has been with us forever and will be. So keep up the fight. And if you have any questions... I'll see if I can answer them. <laughs> yes, sir, right there. Was your uh, scanner chart, was that like what you call a shotgun pattern? Yeah. A scatter chart, yeah. No, no, my, my shotgun has a better group than that. <laughs> Mike. I was going to ask you about that. That's why I gave you that little flyer. The series you did there of the five major items, the problem with the book is if you print it out, it have this kind of voluminous, right? When people go to these things and talk about print, they need the short stuff. Have you thought about creating monographs like that when I gave you a single sheet of paper with those main points in it? Because it's more important to understand those key things and get down the leaves on it. Right. It's pretty simple. That's why that's the one we gave you is about the. Uh, okay. The if anyone couldn't hear Mike, the question is, you know. Can I come up with monographs, shorter little documents that can be used on specific points? The answer is yes, if I had time and money. I, I, I'm short on both of those. But that's why I let the copyright for gun facts be so liberal. I want you to plagiarize it. 
If you've got a specific event coming up, you know what the talking points of the anti-gun group are, steal my stuff. I encourage you to build your own. Even the graphs that are on there, copy and paste them into your work. Believe me, I've, I've, I've put my logo on just about everything, so I'll still get credit for it. Yes? I have a question on uh, number slide, uh, your, your number four. Um, the one that Oh, you're talking about where men and women work? Well, there was you had, you had a couple slides and you said um, just above Luxembourg was the United States. And no, no. I saw yeah. the United Kingdom. And so I was wondering, was the U.S. off the chart? Yeah, that chart compared the United States to all those other countries. And so it was not on there. This is... This is how much higher these countries are than the United States. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Yes. One of the latest attacks, attack methods from the anti-gunners was to refer to gun owners as gun bondlers. Gun fondlers. Gun. Okay, to repeat what he said, some anti-gun people are referring to gun owners as gun fondlers. Mark, of course, being the notable exception. Try to keep that behind the podium, please. This is a repeat of something. Uh, let me tell you a little war story. Does anyone remember Pete Stark? Oh, yeah. he, he, was, he was my representative for way too long. And I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with him at a town hall meeting once, and it became real obvious that I was not anti-gun. And he popped up and he said, I saw a research report once that said that gun owners were compensating for having small penises. <laughs> And I did some digging. I said, how could there possibly be a research report on this? <laughs> what this was was a joke website created by a political activity director for PETA. <laughs> this is what my representative quoted as science. <laughs> okay, so gun fondler. How do you push back at that? I said, well, that, that's interesting. Why would, why would somebody own a gun? Why would they fire it? Why would they fondle it? I think... The pushback on that is, what is your Freudian dysfunction? Why do you find everything sexual? You know, a cigar is sometimes just a cigar, and a gun is sometimes just a gun. So, I, I heard a, uh, a comparison of gun ownership to sexual predators, the idea that they want to be so vilified and so shunned in a neighborhood they started making sexual references to gun ownerships uh, to create a sexual vilification of gun owners. So if you didn't hear that, the theory is that part of the game plan is to vilify gun owners by trying to associate them with any type of deviant sexuality, including pedophilia and everything else. Let me say that I think this is an act of desperation so transparent that if an undecided person heard that, they would actually suck air at just the audacity of somebody trying that gambit. I mean, okay, I grew up in an abolitionist family in the South. I grew up colorblind, and I have never thought race was an important issue whatsoever. And then one time, I was talking about guns and inner cities and gangs, and somebody said, you racist! And I wish they had said that this year because my daughter just, my daughter, this thin, little, red-headed Irish girl, her husband is about 15 shades darker than midnight. And I wish they had accused me of that so I could pull out my phone and say, here's my son-in-law. How racist am I? <laughs> it's a transparent play. I think the best thing to do with these things is just to roll back and then break out laughing because it is that ridiculous. Yes? But you know, you can actually make a logical argument against death. 
little slanderous technique there by pointing out that most of these people who are following their guns and shooting themselves tend to be LEOs. We even have them on YouTube. The most trusted people in society are the ones following them for some reason unknown and shooting themselves in the leg, the foot, in the restroom at Wendy's or on that little training room video in a classroom and so on. So it's... You have an interesting point there. I, I think if somebody said, go look up, go Google the phrase NRA shooting range and look at the images that Google shows you and then say gangs and guns and look at all the gang members saying they're stroking their nine millimeters, then I think you could say, you know, if there's a fondling problem, it's the inner city gangs. What, what, what are they compensating for? But you never see them stroking a Henry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to have a long talk. <laughs> all right, next. Okay. Yes. So uh, to follow up on that point, um, I've thought about it. In fact, this is not, I'm not the first one to, to, to come up with this. To me, if somebody calls me a racist or a misogynist or a bigot of whatever kind, it means I've won the argument. It means they've run out of logic and facts to to counter you with, and so all they can do is call you names. And so you, you, if somebody calls you a bigot of whatever sort, say thank you. You, you just told me I've won the argument because you can't you can't counter my, my my logic and my facts. I think that's a great tactic. The moment somebody throws something ridiculous at you, just kind of shrug your shoulders and say, well. If that's your only argument, it's been nice talking to you. Because at that point, you can say, you're not my intellectual equal. I choose no longer to talk to you. No, you can't punch them. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe two or three more questions. Well, to your point, never get in an argument with an idiot, because then it's hard to tell who the real idiot is. Uh-huh. I hate to admit that, but I've discovered that the hard way. <laughs> Uh, Mike again. The PowerPoints you have are they available because what you're talking about, you don't have the time for the, uh, the monographs. That's what my team is working on. I wanted to, I talked about it a few years ago. This is a good one here. We'd be happy to convert it to something you can tell us with. Yeah, uh, I will make this slide deck available to whoever's masochistic enough to want it. Okay, yes. We could put it up on our website. I will send it to Fred. Okay. Oh, one other thing. I, I went to your gunfacts.info on my smartphone here, and there's a little drop box called Gun Control Myths. And it lists them. It creates an easy-to-use list. So if somebody says something about assault weapons, you just click on that, and there's the whole argument that in front of you. I don't think you have to break down little snippets. It's available real-time. Let me take a moment to explain. From the beginning, GunFacts was organized into chapters, and each chapter covered one topic. Concealed carry, assault weapons, micro-stamping, uh, guns as self-defense, et cetera, et cetera. The website's broken down the same way. So yeah, if you want one chapter on one topic, you can quite literally just bring it up on your phone, and it will include all the facts, all the footnotes, all the graphs and tables. Um, but also, if you go to the first menu, and the one that says about gun facts, and you press that, there's a little search field in there. And you can quite literally key in your keywords there, and it will bring up everything I've ever encountered about that particular subject. Mm-hmm. All right, one more, and then I'm going to quit boring you all. Mm-hmm. Yes? You know, I do not have any statistics about the demographic breakdown of gun ownership or gun use. I have been maniacally focused on listening to the gun control crowd and then just picking them apart. I will point out one myth, which I have not debunked, but I'm on the track of. One of the popular talking points of the gun control industry right now is that there are fewer and fewer gun owners in America. Despite the fact that gun sales keep going through the roof, there's fewer and fewer gun owners. And I said, mathematically, that does not sound possible. 
Um, so I went and I looked, and Gallup, who asked, do you have a gun? Does anyone in your house have a gun? And you look at the trend line, the trend line has been going down over time. And that's where the anti-gun crowd gets this. There was a problem. Mm -hmm. Criminologists about two decades ago said, wait a minute, there's something really weird here. If you ask men, is there a gun in your house, about 50% of them will say yes. If you ask women, is there a gun in your house, about 30% of them will say yes. Why are women reporting lower household gun ownership rates than men? Nobody's accurately figured this out. Men could be braggarts and saying, yes, I own a gun when they don't. Women could be saying, no, I don't own a gun because they don't want to reveal that or they don't know their husband owns one. Could be a little bit of both. But one of the things I notice about the Gallup trend line is that it fluctuates depending on political circumstance. If you look before Sandy Hook, admitted gun ownership was going up. And then after Sandy Hook, it went down. And then after the panic of Sandy Hook wore off, it started to go up again. So the anti-gun talking point is based on voluntary reporting, not actual measurement. And I think the voluntary reporting is, in and of itself, a criminological study conundrum that's not going to be solved anytime soon. So anyway, I've eaten up a lot of stage time. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here again. Ladies and gentlemen, Guy Smith, Gun Facts. If you want to know anything about how to beat the other side up, this is the man to go to. I encourage you very strongly, go to his website, get his books, get the ammunition you need that's mental, uh, that's educational. I can't tell you how many times in my office alone having to do battle with my English boss and some of the crap that he tells me and the things that he says that have no basis in fact. Having stuff like Guy Smith's information is invaluable. Please take advantage of it.